I hope your sodium levels are okay because we're about to get real salty. Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about the worst and the most disappointing reads of 2022. Now I actually only rated three books in 2022 below three stars. So these were I think two and 2.5 star reads. A lot of the books that I read in 2022 were either three or four star reads. Now I know a lot of you will probably be thinking, hey that's great, you had a great reading year. But it actually honestly bothers me a lot more to have an abundance of three star reads than it does to have two or 2.5 star reads. The reason I say this is because because I consider a three star to be a very, very mediocre read. It's either a book that I enjoyed while I was reading it, but it didn't really do much for me. And I know that I'm going to forget it almost as soon as I'm done reading it. So it didn't really leave a lasting impression. Or the book was just meh from start to finish. There was nothing remarkable about it. There was nothing all of that enjoyable or impressive about it. And it was definitely something that I was going to forget as soon as I read it. So for the most part, I consider three stars to be very forgettable reads. Now, if I have a two or a 2.5 star read, that means that I dislike the book so intensely. There's a lot of negative negative emotions attached to it. And for that reason alone, I'm going to really remember the book that I read. It bothers me a lot more to know that I've wasted my time on books that are forgettable than it does to know that I read a book that I actually really, really didn't like. I know that might sound weird to a lot of people, but I want to be able to look at a book and remember at least the emotions attached to it, remember how it made me feel and remember some of the greater plot points. But three star reads for the most part, that's just not the case. I'm going to look at this book and I'm going to remember barely anything about it. I'm certainly not going to remember the characters. I'm not really necessarily going to remember how it made me feel and it's just going to be something that I look at and get angry by because I don't remember anything about it and those books I typically don't like to keep on my shelves. They are automatically unhauled because they just didn't do much for me. So today we are certainly going to be talking about the three books I rated below the three stars and then I'm going to talk about a handful of three star books that were very meh or very forgettable to me and these are actually books that I had higher hopes for. Now a lot of the time I go into books with limited to no expectations. I don't go into a book expecting to love or hate it unless it's by a favorite author or something like that, something where I know that I should have these high expectations. But for some reason, these books that I'm going to talk to you about today, I did have higher expectations for and they let me down in one way or another. So let's go ahead and talk about the actual worst books that I read in 2022. And then we'll jump into a handful of others that were not quite as great as I feel like they should be. So the very first book that I'm going to talk about today is actually one of the first books that I read in general in 2022. It was the January book club pick for Chelsea Palmer's Patreon book club. This isn't something that I normally probably would have picked up on my own. It definitely wasn't on my radar but I wanted to go ahead and read the book club selection and so I went ahead and picked it up. And this is Twisted Love by Anna Huang. Now on the outset, after reading the synopsis, this book actually sounded like something I could enjoy. It is classified kind of as a somewhat forbidden romance. It is definitely grumpy sunshine, but I felt like the execution of this was so poorly done that it ruined my entire reading experience of this book. So this follows our main character, Ava, and her brother is about to leave for Central America for a year. I forget why, maybe it was like some kind of charity or something like that, but he tasks his best friend Alex with looking after Ava while he's gone. And Ava is not thrilled with this because she doesn't particularly like Alex. She thinks that he's like a cold robot and she doesn't really want very much to do with him. Then of course, over time, their relationship starts to develop and turn into something more. And when the book started, I was actually very much enjoying myself. I could tell that it was really well written. I really liked the banter between the two characters. I was enjoying myself, but then it just started to take a really steep curve. So some of the things I really didn't like about this, first of all, Alex actually became a very overly possessive love interest and I don't like that. I don't mind an alpha male in my romances. In fact, I really, really like that to an extent, but I do feel like that there's a boundary and that there's a line and Alex crossed over that line. He crossed into a level that was very toxic and unhealthy with the way that he was overly possessive of Ava. And then towards the end, it just kind of got a little bit scary. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't a turn on. It was absolutely infuriating when he did it. And so that really made me stop rooting for their relationship just because I could not get past how toxically possessive Alex was towards Ava. There were also a lot of inconsistencies and conveniences thrown in, inconsistencies in the fact that, you know, Alex is supposed to be this very dark, brooding, grumpy character. And then you have the naive ray of sunshine Ava come in and warm up his cold, dead heart. And it is like that in some instances, but it also happens very, very fast. So for example, like Alex is the type that likes casual sex. He doesn't want any emotions involved in sex. He doesn't even like kissing during sex, but yet just after one or two sexual encounters with Ava, he's completely okay throwing that all out the window. He's okay being exclusive with Ava. He's okay kissing 
her during sex and all of that stuff. And so you want to think, okay, well maybe Ava's the one, maybe Ava's the one that he just needed to make him feel all these things. But it happened like in the blink of an eye. There was no buildup, there was no tension, there was nothing that you would normally expect to get you to that level where Alex would actually make those changes. So that was very, very unbelievable in my opinion. There were also conveniences thrown in, very extreme conveniences that had to have been thrown in in order for the plot and some of the things that happened to work. And that actually leads me to the fact that there were some very over the top plot points in here, completely soap opera drama-esque plot points that completely took me out of the story. It was like this author decided to throw credulity out the window and just decided, let's make this the most unbelievable romance of all time. It actually got to a point where I was considering DNFing this story with just 50 pages left because I could not even with the plot lines that this author was throwing in. They were so wild. They were crazy. They were unbelievable. They didn't fit with the story. They took me right out of rooting for any type of relationship between these people. I certainly didn't want them to end up together in the end. This was an ultimate fail for me in terms of a romantic relationship story. And I gave this a two stars and it's completely like traumatized me. Like I will not even go near any Anna Huang books in the future because I hated this book so much. So this next book is definitely one of the worst books that I read in 2022. And that also makes it the biggest disappointment for me in 2022 because it is by one of my favorite authors of all time. I'm talking about Pieces of Her by Karen Slaughter. I love Karen Slaughter so much. I think that she's just the master of suspense thrillers. She is dark and gruesome and she is not afraid to put her characters through some stuff. And typically I think her standalones are the strongest. And at the time that this was written, it might have been planned to go on into a series, which it has since continued. But when I read it, it was basically a standalone. And I was extremely disappointed by this. And that is primarily because of my hatred of the main character in this story, Andrea Oliver. So at the start of the story, it is Andrea's birthday. I believe it's her 30th birthday. And she and her mom are out celebrating. They are out at a restaurant. They are eating. And then all of a sudden, a gunman shows up and he starts shooting people in the restaurant. And Andrea freezes. She doesn't know what to do. But her mom instantly basically takes action and she does what she needs to do to stop the gunman. And all of a sudden, Andrea is seeing a side to her mom that she never even knew existed. So she is completely stunned. And this is a catalyst to events that happen later in the story because these events kind of put the spotlight on Andrea and her mom and her mom is not happy about it. Her mom does not want to be in the spotlight and you find out later why. Shortly after the events in this restaurant, something else happens that really propels the plot forward and it causes Andrea to have to kind of run away for her own safety. Her mother tells her to basically pack up and go and run and do all of these things. And throughout this journey, Andrea is finding out a lot of secrets about her mom. She is definitely realizing that her mom is not who she thought she was, which on the outset sounds fantastic, right? And it should have been. But Andrea was the most useless character I have ever read about in my entire life. Literally everything in this story that had a bit of confrontation or a little bit of conflict, Andrea would completely freeze. She would be unable to speak. She would be unable to move. She would be unable to function as a human being. And that happened multiple times in the story. Now, naturally during an extremely violent event, like with a shooter, I think you would expect yourself to freeze. So I don't really fault her for that. But then later on, when something else happens, the event that kind of catapults the rest of the story, once again, Andrea completely freezes. She completely doesn't know what to do. She's like beside herself. And her mom basically just has to smack her out of it and say, hey, I need you to, I need you to wake up. I need you to pay attention because these are all the things that I need you to do. And I just was beyond frustrated with her throughout the entirety of the story because it didn't end there. Even as she was thrust into this impossible situation, where she had to take off on her own and she had to go on this journey and she was encountering people who knew things about her mom's past. She still couldn't speak up for herself. She couldn't ask the right questions. It was even mentioned in here multiple times that like she couldn't finish a sentence. And I was just so frustrated. I was actually physically gesticulating with how beyond frustrated I was with this character. I could not believe the aggravation that I felt. I don't believe I've ever read a story that made me feel so viscerally frustrated by a character before. So in the present day, you're following Andrea as she's dealing with all this regarding her mother and her mother's secrets. And then you have the past perspective where you're actually learning about her mother and what her mother went through at a young age. There was something about the past perspective that didn't connect with me. It felt very disjointed. I didn't like the way that it was told. I never felt truly connected to it. I didn't really particularly like the past storyline. It did feel a little bit cultish to me, which you think would be really interesting. I just wasn't connected to the overall plot of the past. I was really invested in Andrea's timeline because I thought that it was the most interesting and that's what I wanted to see. But Andrea completely ruined that for me. I didn't want to be in her head. I didn't want to see her perspective because she was just so useless throughout the entirety of the story. And so ultimately it just didn't work for me, which is a real bummer because like I said, Karen Slaughter is one of my favorite authors of all time. I will say that there is now a sequel to this following Andrea Oliver a couple of years in the future and she has completely grown as a character. Not only did I like Andrea a lot more, but I actually really enjoyed the plot of that story. I thought it was really well done and it was definitely more on par with Karen Slaughter as an author. This just was not her best. I've heard a lot of people who love Karen Slaughter feel the same about it. I'm not sure what it was, but I really feel like she could have gone in multiple different directions with both the present and the past timeline and made it a whole lot better than it was and it just 
it just didn't work out. So I give this a 2.5 stars. And then this next one is actually one that I've talked about quite frequently on my channel. It was one that I recently read in December and really didn't like it at all. Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. So Daisy Darker is Alice Feeney's attempt at the and then the Renan trope. It follows Daisy Darker and she is going to reunite with her fractured family on this tiny coastal island where her Nana lives because it's Nana's 80th birthday and they are all reuniting to celebrate. But Daisy doesn't really have very fond feelings or memories of her family. Her two older sisters were quite terrible to her when she was growing up. Her dad was very absent. He is a music composer and so he was always out on the road with his orchestra composing music, never really around. And her mother just never really loved her, kind of neglected her, blamed herself for Daisy's heart condition. And so Daisy never really felt a lot of love growing up. It was only her Nana that ever showed her true love and affection. But they are all competing on this island because they want to celebrate Nana's 80th birthday party. And then shortly after midnight on Nana's 80th birthday, Nana winds up dead. There's this creepy morbid chalk poem on the wall that talks about all of the people in Daisy's family and why they deserve to die and then little clues are being left for them like little home movies that say watch me and see me and notice me and things like that and so all of these family members are trying to determine who could have possibly killed Nana who could possibly want to harm their family and then every hour on the hour another family member winds up dead so again very and then there were none and they're trying to figure out who could possibly be doing this on this island they are trapped actually because during high tide the water kind of comes up and floods the roadway so they can't get anywhere they are stuck of course they are without communication standard tropes that you would expect to see in this type of novel this is another situation that had so much potential but the execution was sorely sorely lacking in my opinion first of all let's talk about Alice Feeney's writing style Alice Feeney overly uses similes and metaphors to get her point across she will say things like life is like or love is like and they continue to use all of this metaphorical language to try to describe her point it was done over and over and over as though she couldn't figure out another way to express herself and on top of that she would impart multiple little pieces of wisdom throughout the story that really didn't seem to fit or further the plot or do anything like that because this is not like a literary fiction this is not a contemporary fiction this is supposed to be a suspense thriller but yet all of a sudden you have Alice Feeney doing these self-help motivational quotes throughout the story that you really don't get anything out of and don't really feel like they belong as part of the story and I don't know why they were there and it was obnoxious because it was done over and over to the point where you are actually noticing them as a reader and if that's the case they're not well done they don't flow well with the narrative of the story so I just didn't appreciate Alice Feeney's writing style and on top of that I was just so insanely bored because what this story really is is just Daisy lamenting on her past with her family. So you're in Daisy's head this entire time. It's entirely told from her perspective and so she will go back down memory lane and talk about all of these past times with her family and then of course those home movies that are being left you know they'll pop in the tape and then they'll see this event and then of course they're going to relive this event. So this was really Daisy and the darker family and just lamenting about how awful they were. And so let's talk about how awful they were because all of these characters were atrocious. You weren't really supposed to like any of them because they were just awful people so you don't want to connect to them and you certainly didn't. I really felt like Alice Feeney was trying to make this a very character driven suspense thriller. She didn't give you anything to even make you want to connect to the characters and because this was told entirely from Daisy Darker's perspective there is that sense of disconnect because you were only in Daisy's head. You were only seeing things from her perspective. You're not getting anyone else's viewpoint and so you can't even try to connect to these characters even if you wanted to. So ultimately I was just very disconnected. I was bored throughout the entirety of the thing. I considered DNFing this book a couple of times and I just didn't because I wanted to know what happened. I will say that for the last hour of the audiobook that's when I started to get more interested in the story. You find out the who done it, and then that leads to the first big twist of the story. But I will say that that was a twist that I actually predicted very 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 early in the story. I would say within the first chapter or two I could tell which direction that this story was heading. And so that first twist I predicted. I didn't necessarily predict how it was going to connect to everything else, how it was going to connect with the who done it and the murders and the why. And I will admit that the very final major twist of the story actually got me. I really enjoyed the way that Alice Feeney took it and that made me want to reconsider and give this a three stars but I just couldn't overlook how awful the rest of my reading experience with this book was. So I decided to settle on a 2.5 stars and this is an example of one that just frustrated me so much. I'm going to remember it. I'm going to remember how it made me feel just because I disliked my reading experience of this so intensely. I think Alice Feeney is really great with the twists. I felt the same about Rock Paper Scissors but the lead up and her writing style just not for me. Okay so those those would be the three books that I considered my worst reading experiences of 2022. Now I briefly want to chat about some of the three star reads that I had a lot higher expectations for. So the first one is The Girl He Used to Know by Tracy Garvis Graves. I had never read anything by Tracy Garvis Graves but I had heard really great things about her story on the island and so when I had the opportunity to get The Girl He Used to Know I jumped at the opportunity especially because Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand really really enjoyed this story. But this is another one that just really didn't work for me. So this story is told in two timelines and each timeline is following the relationship between Annika and Jonathan. In the 1991 
timeline. You are following them as they first meet at college and they first develop this relationship. But then of course something tragic happens and they end up splitting up. And now 10 years in the future in 2001, Annika and Jonathan bump into each other and they kind of start to rebuild their relationship. One of the reasons why I just didn't like this story is because I didn't like Annika. And even though this was a character driven story and I'm a character driven reader, when I don't really care about one of the characters, it really affects my ability to relate and care about the story in general. So Anna is definitely one of those characters that doesn't know how to navigate social situations. She's often saying wrong things at the wrong time. She can't read people. She can't read social cues, social situations. So she is very awkward. She does everything that she can to just kind of keep to herself and stay out of social situations. And when she joins the campus chess club in college, she kind of finds a place where she can belong. And that's where she meets Jonathan and strike up a relationship. And it goes from there. Now, because Annika herself often had a hard time connecting to and relating to others, that made me as the reader have a hard time connecting and relating to her. I found her just very aloof. And now I don't remember if it said it on the page, if she was on the autism spectrum, I very well could have been, but I just had a very hard time connecting with Annika. And it also made it very difficult for me to root for her relationship with Jonathan. Perhaps the biggest grievance that I have with the story was actually how quickly things picked up in 2001. Like their relationship ended very quickly in the early nineties. Jonathan actually really didn't know the real reason behind why their relationship ended. It just kind of ended very, very abruptly. And so now they're meeting back in 2001 and then almost immediately jumping into something with each other. It was almost like no time had passed at all. I didn't really feel like there was a lot of the work that would have needed to go into actually reestablishing the relationship that was abandoned 10 years ago. That was unbelievable for me. Another thing that really, really got me about this story was how 9-11 was used as a plot point to kind of further their relationship and cement their relationship. So Jonathan is like in the World Trade Center as the towers are coming down and Annika is freaking out because she knows Jonathan is there and she doesn't hear anything from him. So she travels to New York to try to find him and all of this stuff. And it just seemed like really, really unnecessary. I don't know why that had to be there. Why did Tracy Garvis Graves have to use 9-11 as a plot point to further the romance between these two characters? And then furthermore, the whole story itself ended rather abruptly as well. Like I felt like there should have been more to it and then it just ended. So overall, it just didn't work for me. I didn't feel connected with the relationship. I didn't believe that they could just bridge the gap in their relationship so quickly. It just overall seemed to be missing a purpose for me. And so because of that, you know, I gave it a three stars. Now that I'm thinking about it, because of the emotion that I have towards it, it might be closer to a 2.5 stars, but we'll go ahead and leave it as a three because I really don't remember a lot of the finer details of the story. I just remember like they met in college. I remember the reason that they broke up, they reconnected and then it just went from there. So this was a fail for me. I also want to talk about The Heart Principle by Helen Huang. Now I read The Kiss Quotient a few years ago and loved that book so, so much. That was such an amazing love story. I read The Bride Test a couple years later and didn't love that one either. That was a very big disappointment going from The Kiss Quotient to The Bride Test. When I picked this up, I had a lot higher hopes because this follows Quan, who is a beloved character in this like companion novel series. And he was featured in the first couple of books. And so I was excited that he was going to go ahead and get his own love story. And I had high hopes just based off of the synopsis. But this is another situation where the female character was just so useless at a lot of points. She had almost no ability to speak up for herself and her inability to communicate what she actually wanted or needed caused conflict that didn't need to be in this story. So the main character in this is Anna Sun. She is a musician who accidentally achieved some kind of brief fame after one of her videos went viral on YouTube. And now she's kind of stuck. She can't seem to progress in her music career. She's trying to master this piece of music, but she just keeps circling over and over, just playing the same things over and over, trying to perfect it. And she really can't move on. She's very, very stuck. And then one day her longtime boyfriend basically comes to her and says, you know what? I think that you are the one that I want to marry, but I want to be absolutely sure. So I think that we should like see other people for a while and, and then go from there and see if we can make our way back to each other. And so Anna's like, you know what? Okay, fine. If he wants me to go and move on and meet other people, I'm going to go out there and have a one night stand. And so using a dating app, she connects with Quan. Now their attempts at this one night stand fail spectacularly the first couple of times they try. And then they just keep meeting up and trying again. And then eventually the relationship develops into something more. Now Quan definitely has his own issues, his own insecurities that he is trying to work through, but he really likes Anna. He really wants to give it a shot, but Anna is feeling a lot of pressure from her family. And on top of that, she was actually recently just told by a therapist that she is probably on the autism spectrum. And it explains a lot of the things that she's experienced throughout her entire life. So she's got this recent diagnosis, but her family doesn't understand. Her family does not believe that this is real. They don't really believe that autism is real. They don't believe that she has autism. And so she's really struggling with her family's perceptions of her. She's struggling with what her family wants from her. And she's always been the yes kid, you know, saying yes, even when she wanted to say no. So doing what everybody expects of her, never saying no, never really standing up for herself. And that really causes a problem later on down the road when her ex-boyfriend basically comes back and says, yes, I want to marry you. Let's get married. And everybody's celebrating. Everybody wants her to marry this guy. And Quan kind of overhears all this and Anna doesn't stand up for herself. And then it just 
this becomes a whole thing. It becomes a whole conflict. I just cannot handle weak, spineless doormat women. Now I understand this could be a cultural thing. It could also be part of her autism diagnosis and things of that nature. And so I'm trying to be sensitive to that as well. But it just bothered me to no end that Anna was not even willing to speak up for herself when she was about to lose something that was very, very important to her. And I just cannot stand that in characters. So this is another situation like in Pieces of Her where I was just so outwardly frustrated by this situation that it was making me very angry while reading this story. I loved Quan so much. He was not the disappointment in the story. He was everything that I wanted. And he was just such a cinnamon roll and he deserved all the happiness in the world. And then he gets this weak woman who cannot stand up for herself and cannot fight for their relationship, especially because Quan is not really what Anna's family wants for her. You know, he's tall, he's bald, he's tattooed. Anna's family looks at him and is like, ooh, I don't, I don't know about this guy. But she's just not really willing to stand up, you know, until the very, very end. And that got me and it affected my reading experience of this. So I had high hopes going in, but it just didn't work out for me. And I'm really disappointed that two of the three books in the series did not live up to that very first book, which was so strong. I do love that Helen Huang puts autism rep presentation in every single one of her books. That's something that she personally deals with and she has a lot of experience with. And so I love that aspect of these stories. But the plots of The Heart Principle and The Bride Test were just, they were just so lacking for me. And so unfortunately, The Heart Principle, I gave it a three stars and I expected so much more from it. It just didn't live up to what I was expecting it to be. I also want to go ahead and mention Blood Sugar by Sasha Rothschild. This is a true situation where I don't remember anything about this story, which is a bummer because I went in and was really loving the premise and the writing style and then it just disappointed me so immensely. Now when I was originally going into the story I had no expectation. This was a fairly new release at the time. I didn't really know a whole heck of a lot about it. I just went ahead and decided to read it and once I started to figure out what the story was about I really liked the premise of it but the overall execution especially towards the end just really let me down and so now I'm in this situation where I don't remember almost anything that happened in the book so it's the epitome of a mediocre three stars and this book didn't have to be that way. It could have been so much more more. So I would characterize this book as the character study of an abnormal serial killer. I don't necessarily even think that serial killer is the proper term for the main character in the story, but she is a murderer and you know that from page one. This follows our main character Ruby and she has killed three people over the past 25 years. These three people, for the most part, Ruby all felt deserved to die for one reason or another. She feels really no guilt about her crimes, but Ruby is not really a sociopath. She is not really what you would think of as a murderer. You know, she's still a very empathetic and compassionate person. She loves animals. She works with animals. She she has a dog. She actually also currently works as a therapist to aid people in their own trauma. So she's very compassionate. She's very empathetic. She has all of these emotional capabilities that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find in somebody who murdered people and feels no guilt about it. However, at the very beginning of the story, you're seeing that Ruby is in a police interrogation room and she is actually being questioned by the police regarding the death of her husband, which is the one death that she didn't actually cause. But because she has been linked to three deaths previously, one of the cops in the interrogation room actually thinks that there's more to Ruby than what is on the page. And so now he's also digging into those past deaths. Even though all of those past deaths seem to kind of have been like an accident, Ruby was there in the vicinity and she kind of connects them all. And so now this police officer is suspicious about that. And so the book is told in combination with past and present timelines. So you're following her in the present day as she's being interrogated, but you're also getting snippets of her past from the time she was five years old when she made her first kill up until the present day timeline. I found this to be a very overall interesting plot, a really interesting way to tell the story. But by the end of the story, I couldn't help but asking myself, why? What was the point of the story? So I want to continue talking about this book, but there could be some spoilery things happening here. So if you want to read this story and you don't really want to risk possibly knowing what happens, please wait until the picture of the book is off the screen. So I had a really hard time categorizing this book because a lot of people are calling it a suspense thriller, but it wasn't suspenseful or thrilling at all. And it wasn't even really a mystery because the mystery seems to be what happened to her husband since she wasn't the cause of her husband's death. But you find out pretty early on how her husband died and it was very very human it wasn't anything scandalous or anything like that so it's not suspenseful it's not thrilling it's not even a mystery it's definitely not highbrow enough to be literary fiction but I don't think it's light enough to be contemporary fiction so this is a this is a book that I really have trouble placing into any one specific genre and because I have no idea where it fits I also have no idea what message the author was trying to convey or portray with this story at all and the reason I say this and this is where it possibly gets a little bit spoilery is that why are we going through through all of this? Why are we reliving Ruby's past? Why are we going through this investigation where she's possibly being accused of killing her husband if literally nothing is going to come of it? And that's really all I'm going to say about that. But literally, you're going through all of this for 
pretty much absolutely no reason because at the end of it all, nothing happens. So I very much enjoyed being in Ruby's mind. Some of the observations about life and stuff that she made through the book were very on point. And like I said, this was so unique in just the subject matter of the story. You're reading from this perspective of a woman who has killed three people for her own reasons because she felt they deserved to die. She feels no guilt about it, but she's also not a sociopath. She's a normal functioning human being who has killed three people and still goes on to live a very normal life, a very compassionate, kind, empathetic life. And so I found her absolutely fascinating. And overall, I thought that this was a pretty well written story as well. And so I had such high hopes for it, but it ended up letting me down because it went absolutely nowhere by the end of it. I'm just really confused over the end goal of the story because the ending was so lackluster. There was nothing climactic about it. There was nothing that made the entirety of the book worth it towards the end. I thought that we were building up to something and we absolutely were not. And so that's why I ended up giving this a three stars. That's why it made this list because I had so many more higher expectations from it. I also want to talk about Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. This was a really big disappointment because I absolutely adored the love hypothesis. These are part of her women in STEM romance novels and so they all feature science very very heavily. And Love on the Brain features our main character Dr. B. Koneswager and she actually works for the National Institute of Health but she is being sent to NASA to help co-run this project that deals with astronauts and their helmets and she is absolutely thrilled until she finds out that her college arch nemesis Levi is going to be working on the project with her. So this is supposed to be kind of like a hate to love kind of romance. Now B doesn't know why but Levi has always hated her ever since college and so she's not necessarily thrilled to be working with him and then of course their project gets off to a less than great start but soon she kind of starts to see Levi as an ally and their relationship starts to progress from there. So let's go ahead and just get some of my gripes out of the way. So first of all I felt like this book could be very very heavy-handed with the social commentary. So yes I understand that as a women in STEM novel there's going to be a lot of references to the sexism and misogyny that women in STEM face and I totally totally get that and I understand it and I actually appreciate seeing that and, and making readers aware of what actually still happens in this field today. But throughout the book I just felt like there were many instances of it being overdone. Allie Hazelwood using her book as a platform to spout her own social commentary and ideology, which I hate when authors do that. It drives me absolutely bonkers. It's one of the reasons why I DNF'd Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead. B as a character was also almost comically dense. For being such a smart woman in STEM, she was just very, very thick with regards to especially like social interactions and social cues. She is based on her past experiences with Levi that Levi absolutely hates her and she's unwilling to let anything convince her otherwise. Even when Levi is outright telling her, B, I don't hate you, I never hated you, she absolutely refuses to believe that. She thinks that her perceptions were correct, that Levi hates her, and so that is how she is proceeding throughout this whole story. Even when she and Levi start to have this casual sexual relationship and Levi starts kind of hinting that he wants more and he likes her and he wants to be more than just casual with her. She absolutely refuses to see it. Her brain will not let her understand this is happening. So I was very frustrated by that, that this very smart woman was so unbelievably dense to what was happening around her. And then of course, Ellie Hazelwood does use the miscommunication trope to further the plot and the story and the conflict, which I absolutely hate. I hate when miscommunication is used in stories like this. It frustrates me absolutely to no end. So that really didn't need to be there. It also didn't need to be there is this little side you've got male plot line that they had going. It served absolutely no purpose and added nothing to the story and it was just thrown in there I don't know to like add some pages of content I have no idea what it was in there for now I am usually a sucker for the you've got mail trope in stories but this was just such a small blip it wasn't even a main part of the story and I didn't understand why it was there so there were a lot of technical issues that I had with the story I for the most part overall liked B and I liked Levi and I rooted for the relationship I thought that they were very cute but just overall there were so many issues that I had with the story and it made me actually very angry by the end of it I was very disappointed because I loved the love hypothesis so much and this didn't live up to it at all. Not even a little bit whatsoever. And so now I'm kind of very trepidatious about going into the next book, which I believe is set to release in 2023. If I read that and feel the same way as I did about Love on the Brain, I don't think I'm going to be able to continue with these novels or with Allie Hazelwood in the future. I would hate to think that the love hypothesis was like a one hit wonder for her because I know a lot of people actually do really like Love on the Brain. It has a solid like 4.1 rating on Goodreads, but it just, it just didn't work for me. It was not for me. 
All right, sadly, the final book that I want to talk to you about here is The House Across the Lake by Riley Sager. I think by now that many Sager fans know that Riley Sager is pretty hit or miss, and whether or not he's going to be hit or miss is entirely dependent on the reader. I have not yet met one Sager fan that has absolutely loved every single one of his books. They love some and they dislike some. And some of the ones that they love, I didn't, and some of the ones I love, they didn't. So it's very hit or miss, but he's consistently entertaining. So I will always go back to read his stories no matter what he writes, because I do trust that he has the ability to write a solid suspense thriller, one that's going to be entertaining, engaging, with interesting characters. I had high hopes that The House Across the Lake was going to be the next favorite of mine from Riley Sager, but alas, it was not. There were a lot of issues that I had. So this is following our main character, Casey Fletcher, and at the time of the start of the story, she is kind of a failing actress. She has recently been widowed, and she had some, like, publicity scandals, and so she is being sent to a family cabin, I think it was in Vermont, to just kind of lay low, stay away from publicity, and things like that. Casey definitely also does have a problem with alcohol. She is, I don't even know if I would want to call her a functioning alcoholic, but she is definitely a, an alcoholic and she kind of spends her days spying on the neighbors across the lake. They live in like this beautiful glass house. And so with binoculars, she can spy on this married couple named Catherine and Tom Royce who seem very, very glamorous. And then one day while she's out on the lake, Casey actually saves Catherine from drowning and it causes the two to strike up a friendship. But regardless of the friendship, Casey still cannot really help herself from watching. And so she's still spying on this couple and then one day, Catherine kind of goes missing. She's no longer responding to Casey's messages. And Casey thinks her husband, Tom, had something to do with it. And she is determined to find out what actually happened to her friend, Catherine. And then, of course, the story progresses from there as she's uncovering all of these secrets and she's uncovering the truth of what really happened. So the first thing that I want to say, and this is not something that's going to affect everybody. This is only going to affect people who listen to the audiobook. One of my main grievances is when audiobooks decide to use older narrators to narrate a younger female character. I believe the main character in this story was in her mid to late 30s and they used a narrator that was easily in her mid to late 50s. Was she a terrible narrator in general? No. However, the discrepancy between the ages of the narrator and the main character really changes the way that I view Casey's character. So instead of viewing a woman that's closer to my age, I was viewing a woman that was closer to my mother's age. And so that really affects the way that I'm able to picture the events of the story. And I don't like that. So I just wanted to kind of put it out there because I cannot necessarily say if I would enjoy the story more if it had a more applicable narrator, but it definitely does affect my enjoyment of it to some extent. Now one of the main grievances that I hear about this story isn't necessarily one that I have. It's about how overdone the trope is of this alcoholic woman who is spying on her neighbors. She thinks she saw something that may or may not have happened. She may or may not be a reliable narrator. You know, this is definitely something that has been done. It's been done with the girl on the train. It's been done with the woman on the window. So you definitely see it over and over. I didn't necessarily mind it here just because Casey is truly an unapologetic drunk. She knows that she's a drunk. She intentionally remains a drunk. She has her own reasons for being a drunk and that's mentioned throughout the story. My problem with it here is that it was half of the story. You know, it was Casey pouring a drink, taking a drink, lifting a drink. Like we get it. We know she's a drunk. She likes her booze. I didn't necessarily feel like it needed to be mentioned over and over and over again, but I understand that Riley Sager really wanted you to understand the level of Casey's alcoholism, that she was really fully into the bottle. You know what I mean? And he really wanted you to believe that she was an unreliable narrator. So you wouldn't depend on what she was seeing and you would distrust Casey as you were distrusting maybe Catherine's husband and um, some of the other characters in the story. I get why he did it. It was just done over and over and over again. Now I want to talk about the twist. I'm not going to give away what the actual twist is, but some of the things I say might be a tad bit spoilery. So again, I'm going to ask if you have plans on reading this and you don't want to risk being spoiled at all, please be sure to wait until this is off the screen. So if you've read a lot of Riley Sager books in the past, you know that he tends to toe the line between paranormal and reality. A lot of his books kind of make you think that there is something paranormal going on. But in the end, a lot of the time, it's just a man in the mask, right? It is Scooby and his gang unmasking this average man who is causing shenanigans. In House Across the Lake, he actually goes there. That's all I'm really going to say. I'm just going to say that there is a supernatural, an actual supernatural element to the events that were done in this book. And I didn't like it. I wasn't expecting it. And there wasn't any lead up to it. Not really anyway. There were like brief snippets and mentions of like this legend around the lake and stuff. But it wasn't a big part of the story. And if you weren't really paying attention, you would let it fly right past you like I did. In fact, I didn't really understand why it was being mentioned at all until the twist. And then I was like, okay, I guess I can see why it was mentioned, but it still felt completely out of left field. And it was also like the supernatural phenomenon thing that wasn't even very much explained all that well. It was pretty creative. If I'm being honest, like I didn't see it coming and the actual twist was pretty interesting, but because I didn't really feel like it fit because it didn't feel like it went along with his past stories because there was really no buildup or anything to it. It just felt so out of place. So while I didn't necessarily love the 
supernatural aspect of it, it ended up revealing other things about the story that I did find interesting. There was also another little twist that was thrown in there as well that I liked. I do feel like Sager has a really strong ability to take books in directions that you don't see coming. Like my favorite is The Last Time I Lied. I really, really did not see the twist coming at the end of it. And I was just like, I remember my reaction after finishing that book was like, nice job, Mr. Sager. Well done. And so I definitely feel like he has this ability to take stories in different directions, whether you like it or not, directions that you don't see coming that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So I truly actually applaud him for that, especially the way that he was able to utilize and maneuver the supernatural element in here. But I really do feel like Riley Sager needs to kind of stick to the realistic and not the surrealistic. When he has a past of using all of these books and doing the same kind of thing over and over and then all of a sudden he's like, you know what, I think I'm gonna go for it here. It just, it didn't really work for me. Now I don't wanna like pigeonhole him. I don't wanna say that he should only do one thing. I really would hate to do that to him. It's just, I don't feel like this worked well. All right, y'all, that is it. Those were the worst or the most disappointing books that I read in 2022. I felt like I talked about these a lot longer than I actually needed to. I have about like an hour of raw footage and I'm gonna have to try to trim that down quite a lot. Please let me know if you read any of the books that I talked about today and if you agree or disagree with my opinions. Please also let me know some of the worst or most disappointing books that you read in 2022. I would love to know or if you've created a video about them, please be sure to link it. I would love to check it out. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys. Thank you.